Hi all, welcome to Besides Athens 2022. I'm Jessica Russo, speaking from London. We are glad to have received your continued support and participation through the years, bringing us to today, the seventh Besides Athens. This year, we have been extremely busy regaining control of our lives back from coronavirus. Till the last moment, we were not quite sure whether we would manage to host an in-person event. Hence, we decided to stream it on YouTube, similarly to last year, in order to save up some energy for next year's event, and maybe a couple of aces in the hole. We cannot thank enough our sponsors who reached out to us this year, offering their support. Just for this year, we decided to not accept any sponsorships as this event is going to be virtual and our costs are significantly lower. However, we have missed you a lot and we are committed to making next year's event a great in-person gathering. Should you wish to sponsor us or support us in other ways, please don't hesitate to reach out to us as soon as possible. Today's agenda includes 12 talks and one workshop. We want to thank our speakers for their amazing efforts. We hope that you will love their talks. If you already follow us on the social media, you must have noticed the design of this year's t-shirt. Next year, when we meet in person, we will have the designs of all three years of our virtual events available for you to pre-order. About CPEs, we will follow the same pattern as last year. Two Google Forms will become available 10 minutes each for you to fill in and submit. The opening of each form will be announced on the stream. Form A will be released in the morning, whereas Form B in the afternoon. Successful completion of both forms will grant you the certificate of attendance for you to be able to claim 10 CPs in two weeks time. During the event, we encourage you to be connected with us on Discord, to chat about the talks and to ask us any questions you may have. Also, we will be posting updates throughout the day. So don't worry if you have missed anything on the streaming. Have a great day and see you in person next year on Saturday, 24th of June, 2023 in Athens, Greece. Goodbye. Hey everybody, I'm Brian Contos. I'm the Chief Security Officer with Phosphorus Cybersecurity. Uh, today's presentation is Cameras, Cacks and Clocks, Enterprise IoT Security Sucks. Uh, this is a story of 2 million interrogated IoT devices. This slide I just said, yikes. Um, I didn't really know what else to call it. So I went over to Shodan, and I think most of you are familiar with that, the Shodan search engine, uh, to see which devices are um, uh, internet accessible, if you will. Uh, and I just typed in a couple terms that you would think of for IoT devices. I've got camera, uh, voice over IP, uh, printer, and UPS. So not very scientific, just typed them in. Uh, but what we find here is almost 5 million cameras, you know, over 250,000 voice over IP phones, uh, you know, 83,000 plus printers, and almost 14,000 UPS systems, which, oh my gosh. And the thing about UPS systems, I won't tell you, but you can Google this. The password is almost never changed, and it's a very, very simple password on, the, on these. It's actually the same credential for username and password on these devices. I don't know why they would be exposed on the internet. But uh, IoT devices don't need to be exposed to the internet for these attacks to happen, but certainly the fact that many of them are increased the likelihood. Um, also, we're seeing a lot of nation states now paying attention to IoT and investing quite a bit. Um, and this is globally. So uh, Russia has this tool called Frontin, which was developed for them by some contractors, specifically for the Russian FSB. And this was an IoT hacking tool designed to find, uh, compromise, uh, and, and compromise IoT devices, install command and control software, and do whatever they wanted from that point, or also use that as a jumping off point to get in deeper into organizations. Interestingly, 
a hacking group called Digital Revolution got their hands on Fronten and released the code. So you can get it from torrents and all the, all the places that you like to get your hacking tools from. Um, another interesting case is uh, there have been IoT devices that have been banned. Actually, the U.S. House of Representatives has passed bills that prohibit federal agencies and contractors from actually using certain IoT devices. So, I mean, they're, they're that well known to have that level of vulnerability that they're, they're just not allowed. In our research, what we've actually discovered, and this, these numbers actually blew me away before I really started getting involved with these organizations, there's about three to five IoT devices per employee. So this is the, the, the craziest looking uh, possible chart to show that. But if we just look at 10,000 employees, for example, 10,000 employees, you probably have somewhere between 30,000 and 50,000 IoT devices. That's a lot of devices. And it's way more devices than you could possibly manually manage in terms of taking care of the firmware and taking care of the passwords and turning off uh, unneeded services. It's just completely untenable. You need automated tools. You need a centralized process to handle that. But it just kind of shows you the breadth and depth of this problem. Now, if you look at law firms, for example, they'll have a little bit less. You look at retailers, they'll actually have quite a bit more. So it kind of depends on industry. But on average, take a look at your organization. There's probably about three to five IoT devices per employee. Right. And we'll get into some of the IoT devices that we see quite a bit of in the worst offenders. And you'll start going, oh, OK, yeah, if I start including these things, I can completely see how that goes. Um, and just like with the stock exchange, we were talking about those cesium clocks. When we go into organizations to do a proof of value and we say, hey, how many devices do you think you have? IoT devices. And they'll say, I don't know, I, I have X. Almost 100 percent of the time, their numbers are off by about 40 to 60 percent. So again, they just didn't know about half of their devices in their environment. So we talked about printers a little bit before. Uh, printers are, are really a special case because everyone's got them and everyone's got a lot of them. We work with some folks in the hospitality industry, for example, where they have tens and tens of thousands of printers, just printers, different models and brands and you know versions and things like that, but they have lots of printers. Now, the thing about printers is most sort of enterprise level printers have about a 20 gig hard drive. It's not huge, it's not small, but it's a pretty good sized hard drive. And what had happened is some attackers had gotten access to these, these printers, um, which by the way, most of these run common operating systems like Linux or Android and things of this nature. In fact, across all IoT, a flavor of Linux or a flavor of Android is by far the most common thing that you'll find. And by the way, they have a lot of the same capabilities, services. Um, in the case of printers, however, they're far more promiscuous in running so many different protocols. They've got every protocol imaginable because they want to be easy to use. They want people to be able to connect to them and use them. It's the point of the printer. So from that perspective, it makes great sense. But attackers know that. And because they know that, they take advantage of the fact that those printers are so promiscuous and there are so many ways to connect with them. So in this particular case, some attackers had gained access to the printer. They had uploaded some of their tools. And this was only to a few dozen printers at the time, but it did expand greatly to hundreds later on. Um, and they used those to go out searching for other critical devices on the network, IT devices primarily. And from them, they were extracting data. This was all about um, intellectual property theft. They were extracting the data, and then they were storing it on those 20 gig hard drives. And I'll get to what happens next. Well, a lot of this activity, because it was all being controlled through um, various remote connectivity uh, controls and, and, and C2 and things of that nature, uh, it created logs. And those logs were showing up in Splunk. And they were anomalous. And they said, hey, we've got a lot of printers that seem to be pretty chatty, and we're not really sure why. And then what they were seeing was data exfiltration. And these printers, they were being set up to exfil data over ICMP. Why? Because everybody allows ICMP out. And even if it's shut off, Network Ops turns it back on to do some testing. They forget to turn it off. Just a really easy way to exfiltrate data. You have to make the packets pretty small. It takes a little bit longer, but it usually goes under the radar. So they were using these printers to grab IT sensitive data, compressing it up, exfiltrating out over ICMP, which eventually caused some alarms to, to go off. And what they found was when they started looking at these printers and they say, God, it's not just one or two. It's, we have several dozen now, more than 100 now that are infected. Um, it was just the firmware. They're running really old firmware. Some of these devices hadn't been updated in uh, up to 10 years. Most of them hadn't been upgraded for about four or five years at least. So they were just sitting there vulnerable. They were doing their job. They were working fine as printers. And usually most people don't pay attention to a printer until it stops, well, printing. 
So the fact that they were running all this old firmware just made them a big target with a big juicy hard drive and an easy way to exfiltrate that data out. Now, talking about firmware, about 26% of the devices we counter um, have end-of-life firmware, meaning that there's just, just nothing we can do with that firmware. It's completely end-of-life. If you're running it, you have to get on a, a newer version of it. Um, of the remaining 74%, the average age was six years old. Um, think about your smartphone. It probably wouldn't work if you had an updated things in six years, and, and I'm almost certain it wouldn't work. Um, but now you're talking about your enterprise devices, again, all of your key systems, especially the systems that manage other systems. And that's a really a scary stat, because if we think about it again, there's not a lot of difference between an IT device and an IoT device in terms of capability, network access, and the type of negative ramifications it can cause upon your environment. And again, with IoT, you can even cause physical harm. So if I went and told you 26% of your IT devices were our end-of-life firmware, you'd jump off this video right now and you'd go fix those. That's how serious this is. So when we start digging into the actual statistics around the vulnerabilities, what we found, and this is, this is probably one of the, the most frightening statistics so far, the CVSS scores, so scores of, of 1 to 10, 10 being the most grievous, 50% of the devices have a score of an 8. An additional... 18% have scores of 9 or 10. These are high to critical level vulnerabilities. These are the type of vulnerabilities where you don't need local access. Um, you can do remote exploitation. They're very, uh, they're very severe. The great majority of the vulnerabilities discovered on these devices were 8s, 9s, and 10s. That's a scary thought. Again, this is one of those things where if this, these were your IT devices, you'd be like, oh my god, what can I do? But because IoT devices historically have been so hard to, first of all, just discover, then manage, then manage the passwords, address the vulnerabilities in the patching and the firmware, uh, manage services, etc., nothing's been done. Let's dive into the biggest IoT offenders. And these are the devices where we see sort of the, the most grievous issues across the board. Now, we see a lot of other devices that I'm not listing here. But, uh, you know, we just had to sort of condense it into the, the ones that keep on ringing out as being problematic. Um, again, the, the pictures that you see here are not the actual brands. I'm not, not going to call anybody out here. That's not the, the focus here. But KVM switches. Again, most of you are probably familiar with KVM switches. Um, but a KVM switch, you stick it in a rack, uh, you connect it to uh, multiple computers, and it lets you control um, keyboard and mouse and video, and sometimes you can cycle power as well. We come across a lot of these devices that are running like Linux Ubuntu version 10. Well, that's from 2010, right? I think the latest version now is 21 point something. It's a little bit past 21.1. Uh, so this is, it's running old stuff, and because of that, it doesn't just have a few, but they have a hundreds hundreds of vulnerabilities. Now think about this. I've spent a lot of money on my endpoint security and application security, identity this and network security that, and now I've got this KVM switch that can backdoor into all these devices, running a version of Linux that's uh, more than a decade old, that if I'm an attacker and I can compromise that, I can do a lot of malicious things to those devices that are connected. I can probably power them off. I can change configurations. I can, you know, modify stuff, steal stuff, whatever I wanted to do. So that's a huge backdoor. And that's one of the reasons that a lot of nation states, and we talked about Russia earlier, are building these tools because why bang your head through the firewall and the IPS and the encryption that and application security and endpoint security when I can just go around that back door? Again, like 1995 with that US robotics modem plugged into the back of that Windows NT351 server in the back of the data center that everybody forgot about, right? So KVM switches, one of the biggest offenders that we see out there. Another big one, lights out management controls. Um, so if you look at the back of this, of this server, we see a couple Ethernet ports on the right and something that looks like an Ethernet port where that arrow is. Well, that's not an Ethernet port. That's a lights out management port, right? That's, that's what you're going to use for management of these devices. Well, the thing, the thing about these is there's a few different flavors. There's HP has ILO. Dell has iDRAC, um, Supermicro has IPMI. Uh, so there's a few different flavors. Those are the main ones. They're just little Linux servers. In fact, there's malware specifically designed to target those little Linux servers for lights out management systems. And again, like the KVM switches, but a little bit more powerful actually, these lights out management controls, 
bypass all that other security that you put on top of that server. So you could have $10 million of endpoint security on top of this thing. But if that interface isn't secure, if it's running a default password, for example, or a weak password, or it has a vulnerability in it that can be exploited because that version of Linux or VX work that's running on that has not been updated in the last 10 years, that's a problem. Because now as an attacker, the things I can do for that is I can shut the system down, I can change the network settings, I can run a shell, some of these guys I can pop open a virtual terminal as well, I can upload software or malware, I can do all the bad stuff that an attacker would want to do. And again, most of your critical servers are going to have these devices. And some people say, oh, well, you know, I didn't even know that thing was there. And that's the problem, again, because there's no good inventory for discovery for a lot of these, a lot of these products. Server cabinets and racks. This is another one that people tend to go, oh, those do have a lot of IoT devices. They sure do. UPS systems, which are notorious for having the vendor's default password, which takes about five seconds to find if you Google it. Cooling systems, cable management, tamper resistance um, sensors, and, and, and all sorts of other things, depending on how fancy that rack happens to be. And they're really cool and they're really capable. They're almost always running the oldest firmware known to man. And the reason for that, I think, the primary reason is, if I wanna upload all the firmware on my rack, including my UPS system and everything else, I need to reboot that system in most cases, which means all those devices that are relying on that, switching gear, routing gear, computer systems, etc., they're going to have to be reboot as well. So there has to be a change window. And when people schedule change windows, they don't always think about IoT devices, unfortunately, which causes this problem. So these devices are frequently, frequently uh, vulnerable. And a lot of these are also tied to KVM switches that we talked about earlier, exposing you to a lot of problems. Uh, physical access controllers. Here's another case where you probably have oodles and oodles of these throughout your environment, whether it's biometrics or um, you know a pin or a scan card or a CAC system, whatever the solution might be. Again, these are these are Linux devices that are that are running on the network. Uh, and in one particular case, we're working with a customer, and they had uh, the system deployed. It was uh, it was all default passwords, but if those passwords were not default and it's crazy to find the default passwords on, on door locks. Um, it's crazy to think, but you always find it. Uh, they had three critical CVEs. So had that default password not been there, it would have been easy enough to get through one of the critical C One of the three, you could pick the one that you like most to get into that system. And we're sitting with the CISO and uh, their team, and we we're actually able to show them with a click of a button, we could have locked or unlocked all 6,400 doors, door lock systems that they had throughout this financial services company. Um, and again, the IoT tax, IoT devices can have that impact on the physical world. Uh, printers, we talked a little bit about printers before. They're certainly one of the most commonly attacked uh, devices, especially from nation states, but cyber criminals like them too. Um, if any of you were at Black Hat uh, back in 2019 in Vegas, uh, there was some research that was released where they found critical level vulnerabilities, again, these are level 10 vulnerabilities, on over 10,000 different printer types and brands. And there's just so many different types of printers out there, but that's, that's pretty incredible. Over, over 10,000 devices had critical level vulnerabilities. And again, they're highly promiscuous, they're running a lot of services, they've got wired and wired list connections, they probably have Bluetooth, they might be running other, other protocols as well. You can manage it via HTTPS or SSH, some of you can tell that into, they're just very, very open and that's taking advantage. And again, because a lot of them have that big storage drive, it's great to use them to attack IT devices, and exfiltrate your data out the way we talked about it before. But again, it's one of the biggest targets um, for state-sponsored hackers. I would say it's probably in the top three. Uh, next one, voice over IP phones and video conferencing systems. Uh, like printers, organizations have a ton of voice over IP systems. Um, and even when people weren't at, at, at the office, there's still so many active IoT systems that we actually saw an uptick in the number of attacks on IoT devices. But now, I guess they're calling it the great return. Here in Silicon Valley, we see you know the likes of Apple and Facebook and Google. People are, are all going back to work again. Traffic's increasing because of that, which is a, usually a pretty good sign. Probably an IoT device could detect that. Um, but there's a lot of these voice over IP phones, and they're usually running a flavor of Android. Uh, what we find with a lot of these devices is they've got undocumented 
SSH administration capabilities running on them with default credentials again. And a lot of this goes back to what we were talking about before with the manufacturers of some of these devices aren't necessarily software development houses. They're more, they, they manufacture things, sometimes like farm equipment and things of that nature. Um, so they have a small crew. They're not putting a lot of time and effort into, into testing, certainly not looking at security. And if they are, it's very little. And because of that, they're saying, well, I'm just going to white label that. I'm going to use that library from that group. And they might not even know they have that undocumented um, SSH with default credentials, right? It, ju it just got rolled out that way because they hadn't done that level of testing. So that's a, that's a pretty scary thing. Um, with this one organization, I guess you can call this a beacon of hope, but maybe it's kind of sad. They had 31,000 phones. Only 700, only 700 had a critical level CVE. As we know, it really only takes one. So these, again, are uh, an example of something that there's just so many. They're so voluminous, 31,000 phone systems. If you wanted to upgrade the firmware or rotate the passwords every 90 days that you use for managing those or whatever steps, it would be impossible to try to do these things manually. And then the last group I wanted to cover were secu our security cameras. These suck the most. <laughs> there's so many of them and there's so many problems. Again, some of these cameras ship directly from their manufacturers with the malware already installed. So you skip the middleman. You just go straight to straight to being infected and having your device controlled. Um, these cameras have been known to actually turn on when they're supposed to be off. They're known to record audio when they're supposed to be on mute. And they also take these streams and they can pipe them back um, to various countries. So that's a problem right there. And again, a lot of these devices have been banned. But cameras are devices that, if they're compromised, they can certainly be used for spying. Um, we mentioned some of the attacks that are very common in IT and IoT and how they're the same from ransomware to data theft, DDoS, command and control, uh, malware distribution, things of that nature. One case we were working with a customer, um, I think they had something like 9,000 or 9,500, a lot. They had a lot of video cameras. And they had been crypto jacked, uh, which most of you probably know that means I, I want to take this device and I want to use it to mine crypto. So they had all these cameras that were doing crypto mining. Um, and the way they detected it, I'd love to say it was some cool SIM tool or alerted this. It was their power bill. Their power bill was really, really high and they didn't know why. And if you've ever looked at organizations that do crypto mining, it's, uh, it's pretty um, energy intensive. So that's how they found it. Um, these guys are usually running Linux, usually at some form of like BusyBox, which is a, a common a common piece that's on there. Um, and the thing that's interesting about video cameras is a lot of the older ones are designed. So I have 10,000 cameras, but they all have to have the exact same password that's talking to the management console, like something like you see here in the middle, um, which which is an architectural flaw. I mean, you could set it up and there's some newer ones where you have the streaming password is the same, but the management password is different. So it has two different passwords uh, because of that issue. So when you're talking about password management on these things, uh, you have to keep in mind that, hey, if, you're, if you are going to change the password and use something complicated, now I have to do it for all 10,000 devices, and it has to be the same thing. It has to be a group password. Again, from a security perspective, not a great design, but sometimes you have to work within the limitations of those devices as well. So again, Virtually every organization has hundreds, if not thousands, or even tens of thousands of these types of devices. There's often finger pointing when it comes to cameras. Well, I thought facilities took care of that. No, I thought IT did. No, I think it was supposed to be security. And it's kind of like Spider-Man, right? They're all pointing at each other. It just, it, it's just very commonly um, targeted and they tend to be very easy to take advantage of. And on the consumer side, Again, we're not focusing too much on the consumer side here, but one of the most popular cameras on Amazon last year, the most popular camera, highest rated, you know, approved this and that, shipped with malware already installed on it. To summarize, um, you know, IoT devices, they're, they're virtually always vulnerable. I wish, I wish there was another, another way to say that. It, it, it just sucks, hence the title of the presentation. Um, historically, it was really hard to just find these devices. Just say, I, I don't even know what I have. I know I got a bunch of cameras and some door locks, I think, and I don't know, lights out management. I hadn't even thought of that. But just finding them, that's, that's a problem. Then the next step, of course, is once they're found, remediating the risks, which is the bigger part of the equation, right? I just don't want to find it. I want to fix it. And then I want to keep it fixed, right? So that's really important. Um, and now there's solutions to help with this, right? Enter Enterprise IoT security platforms. Um, 
somewhat of a newer concept in this world, and I, and I put a couple versions down here. Of course, this is something that Phosphorus does, but we're not the only people that play in IoT security. Uh, you can take a look at some of these other vendors. Everybody has a little bit of a different approach to this, some a little bit more legacy, some a little bit more modern. Um, but now these tools can help you discovering the device and what vulnerabilities are on my device, updating my firmware, uh, managing those credentials and those certificates and hardening those devices. And then what's really critical is integrating with all my other IT security tools for logging, for SOAR capability, for ticketing systems. And then being able to pull all that together with a reporting capability that makes this um, easy for me to manage at scale. And if you're able to do this, not only are you able to sort of discover your IoT environment and lock it down, but you're able to do it at scale with these automated tools and make these devices secure. You're just not hiding them off in a VLAN. You're just not closing your eyes and, and hoping nothing bad's gonna happen. And you're greatly reducing the risk on your organization with something that's very easy to do. In most cases, running discovery from these enterprise IoT security platforms is like running a vulnerability scan, right? The firmware is just kept up there. You don't have to go hunt for the firmware yourself. The integration API integration with the PAM tools is already there. It just works and it just fits. So something you'd probably want to check out if you're trying to address your IoT security. So again, my name is Brian Contos. I'm the Chief Security Officer with Phosphorus Cybersecurity, and thanks so much for your time. Hello, everyone. My name is Christina Skoludi, and I am a cybersecurity expert at NASA. Today, I would like to give you an overview on Team Europe and the International Cybersecurity Challenge. Let's start with the International Cybersecurity Challenge. The first edition of the International Cybersecurity Challenge took place in Athens in June of 2022. In particular, from the 14th of June until the 17th of June, we had a four days event that was uh, following the, the schedule that you can see on your slide. So the first day we had the testing day where people came to test the infrastructure and also the tools that they would use for the competition. Then the day of the 15th of June, we had the first day of the CTF, which was a Geoparty CTF, and the different teams had to compete in five main different categories of Geoparty style CTF challenges. On the third day, we have the Attack and Defense Day, a CTF that is focusing on having an infrastructure with different services that one has not only to attack to the other teams, but also to defend for each team. And finally, at the last day, we have the award ceremony where we announce the winners. The teams that took part in the ICC of 2022 were seven. We had teams participating from Canada, US, Latin America, Africa, Oceania, Asia, and Europe. In total, we had more than 64 nations being involved in the teams and representing the different regions that just mentioned. The ICC takes example from the very successful project of ENISA since 2016, which is the ECSC, the European Cybersecurity Challenge where the different member states and other countries from Europe and the EFTAs have a representation of teams that go to an annual event to compete in a CTF. As mentioned, one of the teams that participated in the ICC of 2022 was Team Europe. And for ENISA, that was a separate project, training and preparing Team Europe for the ICC finals. ENISA's main objectives for Team Europe was to form and train the final Team Europe. We had to make sure that we will create a diverse, balanced and strong team of 15 young people aged from 18 to 26 years old, as it was in the rules of the ICC for participating. We had also to achieve the best possible results for the ICC of 2022. That was one of our main goals. And in order to assure that we will do our best, we wanted to collaborate with people and stakeholders that would help us in this project to train and form Team Europe. So we had the Team Europe trainers, a group of five people from different countries with experience in CTFs 
that collaborated with ENISA closely throughout the training path of Team Europe. We had also the ICC Steering Committee, which is the steering committee that defines the rules and also shares all the information for the different teams that are participating in the International Cybersecurity Challenge. The steering committee of the European Cybersecurity Challenge was also involved since it nominated young people for joining as Team Europe candidates in the first place and out of these candidates for Team Europe we selected the final Team Europe. We also created a subcommittee, the international subcommittee as we call it, of ECSC, which was people that were representing the ECSC steering committee, but at the same time were being consulted by us for everything that was taken into consideration for deciding for Team Europe and for the ICC as well. So we started with the pre-selection process where as I said before, we had to create a pool of eligible members for Team Europe and we reached out to the ECC steering committee where the national representatives proposed up to four candidates each, up to two male and up to two female candidates per country. We had the pre-selection concluding with all the candidates that were nominating successfully joining certain trainings and CTF qualifiers that were provisioned in order to reach to the decision of the final Team Europe. It is important to state here that ENISA covered all the expenses for the candidates uh, traveling and accommodation during the boot camps that we organized and all the events that were dedicated in um, preparing Team Europe and training Team Europe candidates. Also, together with the trainers of Team Europe, we, we prepared all the criteria, the processes for the selection, the training path, um, we prepared the requirements for the platforms, and everything else that had to do with the preparation of Team Europe was done in collaboration with Team Europe trainers. Now, let's look closer at the training path that we developed for Team Europe. We started with uh, setting up an online training platform since May of 2021, where we provided access to the first pool of candidates of Team Europe that we had uh, from, the, from the nominations of the ECSC Steering Committee. In the beginning, we had 36 candidates for Team Europe from the call for expression of interest that we had and from the nominations that we, um, we were provided from the ECSC Steering Committee. All of them were granted access to an online training platform that was a continuous training module that we had. So since May of 2021 until the finals of the international competition, um, we had this platform up and running for all the candidates and later on for Team Europe to be able to prepare, to, to test their skills and to practice. Then, in July of 2021, we had our first bootcamp. In Tallinn of Estonia, we had the first bootcamp where we had all the, th the 36 candidates for Team Europe coming and meeting for the first time and had several trainings on different topics. Um, later on, we had the CTF qualifiers, which was uh, an online event that was, that was held early September for all the candidates in order to assess the, the strong profiles and who could make it for the final team. In the ECSC of 2021 in Prague, we also opened a second call for expression of interest, where we were able to um, collect more candidates for Team Europe, and there we reached to the 55 candidates for Team Europe. After that, we had the second bootcamp where we invited almost all Team Europe candidates in Turin. Um, and we had, again, um, a three days event training on different topics where I'm going to present later on in detail. In uh, March, we had the third bootcamp in The Hague where, again, we had um, team building activities and also trainings for the 55 candidates of Team Europe that we had after the second call. Um, and of course, we had also second CTF qualifier early April in order to again assess the, um, 
the um, the technical skills of the of the candidates and reach to the final decision of who is going to be in the team Europe. So some statistics I have here is that out of the 55 candidates that we managed to have for Team Europe after the second call for expression of interest, we had 21 countries that were represented in this pool of candidates. And the gender balance statistics that I can share here is that we had out of the 55 candidates, 40 male and 15 female candidates for Team Europe. In detail, the bootcamps that I mentioned before are presented here. So in July of 2021, we had the first bootcamp in Tallinn of Estonia, where we had trainings on mobile security and attack and defense. At the third day of the event um, in, in Estonia, we had also a team building activity in order to provide the opportunity to the members, uh, to the candidates of Team Europe to bond and to learn more about um, each other. On the second bootcamp that we had in Turin of Italy, we had trainings on web exploitation and cryptography. And again, we had also a team building activity in order to um, build more cohesion in the team and uh, ensure that uh, collaboration elements are being enhanced. In the third bootcamp that we had in The Hague, we had, of course, again, trainings that were focusing on attack and defense once again, because we consider it an important element since it was 50% um, of the ICC finals. And um, that made it a topic, of course, that it was of importance. But we had also trainings on forensics and on binary exploitation, as you can see. Besides the trainings and the bootcamps that I mentioned, we had also two CTF qualifiers. We wanted to make sure that we have increased participation during these online events. And for that reason, we organized them during weekends. It was a 24-hour straight event both times for both CTF qualifiers in order to accommodate all different time zones as we had candidates also residing in different countries than EU. We had to assess the technical skills, but also the strategy of all the people that would take part in the qualifiers. And in order to make sure that we uh, take the best experts that we need in the main categories that would be also in the ICC finals, we had the qualifiers focusing in the five categories of challenges that would be also the five categories of challenges for the ICC. So we had web exploitation, binary exploitation, reverse engineering, forensics, and crypto um, challenges in the CTF qualifiers in order to identify the best profiles in all these categories. We had, of, of course, three difficulty levels per category, easy, medium, and hard. So that would allow people that are not mastering specific categories to also accumulate points for other categories. And in total, we had 15 challenges in each CTF qualifier. As I mentioned before, the first CTF qualifier with 36 candidates that we had at that time took place on September of 2021, while the second CTF qualifier took place in April of 2022 with 55 candidates. After this training path that I presented, we had the final bootcamp when we selected the final team Europe. So following the second CTF qualifier, we were able to have all the information available that uh, would allow us to select the final team Europe. And after selecting the final team Europe, we are organized for one more bootcamp only with the uh, team Europe plus five um, people that were added in the reserve list. So we had in total 20 people that participated in the final bootcamp uh, of Team Europe from the 13th to the 15th of May in Vienna. It was again a three days event that was aiming to simulate the days of the ICC finals. So the first day in order to test the tools and also to, cl uh, to clarify the roles and responsibilities on each of each team member, we had the GeoParty CTF, where we had 
challenges for, from the different five main categories that I, uh, that I showed to you before and the people collaborating for the first time as a team um, in order to um, successfully solve the challenges of the Geoparty CTF. In the second day, we had an attack and defense CTF where all together, again, they had to collaborate as a team, um, define the roles and responsibilities on who is, um, who is patching, who is exploiting, who is doing the sysadmin, all these different roles and responsibilities, again, had to be divided within the team, but also there was an opportunity to test the tools that they had available in order to, uh, to, to conduct the attack and defense CTF. On the third day, we had a technical briefing. After observing what was um, learned from the two days' experience that we had previously, uh, we had a session dedicated on the lessons learned and on um, what should be improved uh, until the finals. And of course, we had also a training that um, was focusing on Windows this time. And this is Team Europe. In this nice picture, in the sunny weather of Athens, you can see the 15 members of Team Europe plus the five members of Team Europe trainers in a picture right before the first day of the competition of the Jeopardy CTF. Some words about the diversity of Team Europe and the statistics. So out of the 20 people that we had selected, which was the 15 main members of Team Europe plus the five members for the reserve list, we had a percentage of 20% of female um, represented in the team and 80% represented um, uh, of males in the team. We also had uh, 12 countries represented in the final team of 15 members of Team Europe and we had 15 countries represented in the um, final team of Team Europe plus the reserve list members. As you can see there, these are all the different countries that we had from uh, Czech Republic to Italy to Spain to Norway to Belgium. You can see that we had people coming from many different countries of Europe. Some words about the ages that we had in the Team Europe. So in the blue bar charts, you can see that we had people from 21 to 26 years old in Team Europe, while in Team Europe, um, uh, calculating also the reserve list members, we had people from 19 years old up to 26 years old. And this is the skill set of Team Europe. As I mentioned before, we have five main categories for the Geoparty CTF, which is the binary exploitation, the reverse engineering, web exploitation, crypto, and forensics. And in order to know what are our strengths and weaknesses, we had this nice diagram where we had, with the blue line, represented the skill set of Team Europe, while with the red line, we had represented the skill set of Team Europe plus the reserve list. And after all this preparation, after all this hard work, and after all these trainings that we had and I presented to you with Team Europe, we were in the very happy position to win the first place in the International Cybersecurity Challenge. So you can see here a very nice picture of um, the Vice President of the European Commission, Margarita Schinas. Uh, giving the uh, prize of the first uh, place of the overall winners to Team Europe, uh, where um, they celebrated a lot and they, of course, enjoyed a lot this, uh, uh, this win. We had, of course, Asia coming second and also US coming third. And I think that um, uh, bravo and congratulations is deserved to all the teams that participated in the ICC. So if you're interested also in participating in the next Team Europe candidates, since we are preparing now already for the next year competition that is going to take place in the US for 2023, please register 
in the open ECSE.eu and make sure that you don't miss out the CTF that we will organize in order to identify young people from 18 to 25 years old that can master one of the main categories of challenges that we presented and that can make it for the candidates of Team Europe for next year. If you're interested in finding more information about what I presented for Team Europe and the International Cybersecurity Challenge, feel free to reach me through email or my mobile and I will be responding back to you as soon as possible. I'm Christina Skuludi and thank you very much for your attention.